We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 117 of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this one, Bob, what we're going to be looking at is a really interesting topic. I can't wait for this one. Falling in love with your clients in the therapy process. Well, you know, Jackie, I think we'll be doing these two years or however long we've been doing these titles. But I always love it when you say that um, when the introduction goes in, wonderful Bob Cook. And, you know, when we talk about love, the English language or the English, yeah, the English language is very, very limiting. Yes. So if you go to Greek culture, for example, there's about seven words for various types of love. Same in Italy and many other countries, but in England or the United Kingdom, love covers many different aspects. I yeah. say wonderful Bob Cook is a very loving, caring thing to say, we could say, but we haven't got the different types of love. So in Greek, you've got agape, haven't you? You've got eros. I, I can't remember all the nine various forms of love, but we haven't got that. It's very processed in our language. It's very definitive. So when I'm talking about, you know, falling in love with a client, my colleague beat me to what I was going to say anyway, because I said to my colleague, friend, um, I was going to discuss this podcast, and he said what I was thinking about, but he said it before. So I didn't say it, so he took ownership of this, but I actually had thought this, and that is my report. <laughs> I'm laughing, we've thought of it, but my response is, um, well, I'd be worried if I didn't fall in love with my client. Interesting. At Again, a... it's what your perception of it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. Right. So if love equals taking account of, taking care of, yeah, thinking about them. The last podcast I think we did, or another part, which is about tissues and, um, you know, tea, it's in this ballpark. Yeah. Taking care, thinking about them. Uh, uh, promoting loving actions, spending time worrying about them, being concerned about them. They're all in the ballpark of love. Yeah. It depends what we mean by love. Yeah. You know, um, if we're going to talk about romantic love, which part of this podcast will be about, yeah, then we're into perhaps another whole story, which a lot of this podcast has been about. But Love on a more general sense. I mean, we haven't got the, the word in the English language. Taking time to take our client to supervision if we're stuck. Yeah. Thinking about them. Maybe offering a cup of tea. Passing a, like a, a tissue box. Um, spending time pondering clinical processes being moved from the heart they're all in the ballpark of love yeah the love actions. yeah yeah there's an energetic love stream so from that perspective i'd be worried if i wasn't thinking fondly loving counting all the things i've just said per se yeah and i, I, I and i bet my bottom dollar the same for you yeah yeah, I think when when I read that title, there was there was you know that instant thing. Oh, you know, is he going to ask me if I've ever fallen in love with one of my clients? And then you think about the intimacy and and the relationship side of of love and everything. But I also know that you know every one of my clients have a special place in my heart for mm. whatever reason. Yeah, lots of different reasons. Mm. You know, if they I I feel moved by the story to me is in a you know a show of affection or or caring about them does that equate to love it like you said there's there's lots of different ways that we can show it absolutely so when you say how are you today i was thinking about you last week yeah what actually happened for you 
when you left the therapy session. Yeah. Now, isn't that a loving action that you would be thinking about your client, that you'd be pondering about them, that you'd remember what you worked in the last session? Yeah. Now, the clients may never have had that type of love, if you like, and many of my clients didn't. Yeah, yeah. So that type of fertile ground, that type of attitude can be very reparative in its own sense anyway. Yeah. And there's something, I don't actually know what they all are, and it's very American or whatever, but the love languages and how we need to be shown love, whether that's by, you know, different acts like people making us a cup of tea you know going on to that podcast that we, we recently did about tissues and tea whether it's you know by touch or you know acts of kindness you know we we all receive love in lots of different ways for me it's being seen and heard mm. that makes me feel important and and cared for by the other person if i'm literally seen and heard mm. Mm. And for many, many, many of my clients over all the years, a lot of the therapy has been about this type of attitude and um, the client being able to take mm. the loving types of actions and thoughts, which they often had never, you know, had in their lives. Yeah. Or, in fact, would think it was a trick yes or yeah. technique or some sort of language like that and we find it so hard to take yeah and i think it, you know when sometimes when we have given love in in a, a way that connects with the client it can change the dynamic somehow oh. i you know i've had it where some clients have literally withdrawn because it's been it's felt too too intense or being seen and heard in a therapy session can be too much for them. Yeah. And that's really, really important for the therapist to think about. Yeah. And to, to notice if it happens and then bring it back to the therapy room and discuss, you know, how did it feel for you when I said that or did that? Yeah. yeah. Because if, if people haven't been brought up on a full meal. Yeah. Uh, say they've been brought up on crumbs rather than the full meal. And if they have a full meal, they'll be sick. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so we, a really good metaphor, Bob. And I think that's how it feels. It, it, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Overwhelming. That's yeah. Right. And then they'll close down. Yeah. Um, so it's important if the therapist is going to think this way relationally, they consider all this in terms of a developmental perspective with their clients. In transaction analysis, it would be the word script. Yeah. They spend some time thinking about the client's script within the therapeutic relationship. Yeah. Yeah, because giving and receiving love often can be seen as, you know, it's that place of vulnerability, you know, if it's going to be received and, and you know, reciprocated or whatever it is. So it, it can be quite triggering for clients. Mm. Oh, in fact, extraordinarily. Yeah. Extraordinarily triggering. Because, you know, um, often for many, many clients who've never had that love or that's what they've dreamt about or that's what they've desired or that's what they've fundamentally needed but have never had. Um, it's such a challenging process. Yeah. To be able to open their heart up or be vulnerable with someone um, in a completely different place in their history becomes so challenging. And you know, Jackie, is often the therapy in the end. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. I think it, it, it shines a light on what they haven't had in their upbringing and in their past when it is given to them freely you know without any i don't know you know bartering or you know something attached to it if love is just given for the sake of it 
yeah. you know that, that yeah. can often shine a light on that that's not how it was when they were growing up you know there, there was always an, a, something attached to it they had to there was a payback or a clause to love they had to do something yeah yeah or the people that have been so neglected so neglected they don't even know what loving actions are yeah so any loving actions go through a, a psychological filter for them so by the time it they have to receive it they've got a, they've got a a coat of armor called denial so they don't even recognize it yeah and i feel sad to i'm thinking of a lot of my clients and feel sad talking this way but you know it, it's so true and the therapist needs to really i believe understand these things we're talking about and understand the defenses that clients have often had to put up for survival record mm. reasons and it's very important that the therapist doesn't stop these loving actions but they may have to dilute them yeah yeah absolutely because it can be overwhelming when you've not had it before mm. And you, you mistrust, do you know what I mean? You you don't believe it. There's there's like you say, the, the the hurdles that the therapist will have to jump over sometimes to prove that what they're doing doesn't have ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. It it needs to be a slow process. Extraordinarily slow. Yeah. And in the type of therapy I practiced for years and years, which is developmental integrative relational psychotherapy, then what we're, I'm talking about here is really, really important to understand for the therapist more than anything else, because it's like then they will understand the filtering system of the client, the defenses of the client. They'll understand how to pace the psychotherapy process. They won't take withdrawal, rejection, denial as a personal uh, attack on them mm. or, or various other things. And they will understand all, all what we're talking about here jackie in a therapeutic lens yeah yeah and i think that's an important point you know whether the, the therapist takes it personally the client's reaction to certain things do you know what i mean and i know we've spoke about it in the past getting it wrong in therapy you know and how we come back from making a mistake and, and maybe doing too much too soon and all those sort of things yeah, I, I, I think what we're here is really important. Now, Richard Erskine, one of my mentors and the developer, the, the developer, if you like, of uh, integrative developmental relational psychotherapy and the um, founder of the International Integrative Psychotherapy Association, um, talked about the, the, the person's relational need for expressing love yeah you know to you know we call call that kindness if you like but it's a relational need within all of us to you know or a desire if you like to express love and so for him i think what we're talking about here is how he would see therapy yeah now let's jump back then from that to what I think you hinted on and what I would just like to talk about for a few minutes, which is in the therapeutic lens of erotic transfers. Yeah. And that's when we might want to term what would, the other end of clarity, what I've just been talking about in some ways, romantic love. You know, so if the therapist finds themselves um you know coming from a place of romantic love or sexual love or however we want to term this it's very very important that they um go to their supervisor yeah that's the first thing they need to go to yeah as soon as they become aware of these feelings now when a soup when somebody comes to me say 
talking about what we're just talking about here. My first question probably would be, whose love do you think this is? Romantic love do you think this is? Do you think this is a projection on you from the client and you picked it up by projected by identification and um, it doesn't actually come from you, it comes from yeah. someone else? Or do you think it is an actual physical attraction in the here and now from both of you? Yeah even from you so you know there's an exploration which we could call erotic transference you know it's an exploration of the erotic transference but if it's a physical attraction in the here and now and the client is sorry the therapist is certain about that yeah and it's not got any transference history for example yeah but, you know biological or chemical or whatever we want to look at then the therapist then has to think, well, this is this going to hinder any therapeutic process? Am I going to act out on this? Is this going to be counter counterproductive? And what do I do about this? So there's lots of options, you know, but I think they need strongly to think about referring on. Yeah. I'll go past further than that. They need to refer on. I think it's a really valid point, though, when you're saying about is this transference, is this their feeling, or is this something that's being projected on them? Because in therapy sessions, it can it can be a you know a, a, a den of emotional stuff that's in there. I know for me, you know, sometimes I'm I'm quite good at picking up somebody else's stuff whether it's usually <clears throat> anxiety i'm really good at picking up anxiety from other people and then realizing that i'm starting to feel anxious but i know mm. it's not my anxiety mm. it's somebody else's mm. but you, you know as as a, a, a new psychotherapist i did i wasn't even aware that that was what was happening a lot of the time i thought i was feeling anxious mm. Mm. you know literally my heart you know would would race and i couldn't work out what was going on for a while mm -hmm. so it's a very important and another important question as as the supervisor explores the transference with the therapist is to ask the question in this transferential matrix or projective identification process is who is the client for you yeah and ask the therapist just to reflect on that. It doesn't have to be actually be a person in my part of yourself, the younger part of yourself. Could be even, you know, to do with qualities. And it might be a real person. Yeah. Yeah. Could be a mother, could be a sister, it could be somebody you've never had. It could be but we're starting then to explore transferential implications and psychological processes. Yeah. And I think those that whole way of talking clinically about what's happening in the therapy room is why supervision is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And in that situation, you would still refer on and, and say well, to I'd them want that to you need to all the work through this in yeah. your own therapy. Well, I'd want to explore all completely what you just said there. I want to explore it from a transferential point of view. Yeah. I'd want the person to explore it therapeutically. Yeah. And if it's a physical attraction in the here and now, with any, without any transferential, without any, you know, historical aspects, and if they think they aren't able to um, do the therapeutic, therapeutic process because they're always in inverted commas lusting after the client or, or whatever language we want to hear, they have to refer on. Yeah. Because I think we we need to mention that it's not ethical to be in a relationship with a client. A hundred percent. That's that's not somewhere where any of us no, no, should no. be going. No. I mean, I, I have a colleague I'm thinking of my head who said, "Well, there is another." I'm I'm hearing it in my head now as I speak. Well, there's another option, Bob, and the other option is, um, or he would say anyway, um, as a supervisor. Well, another option is you could talk to your client about this. Yeah. 
you could say, well, you know, I, uh, before we go any further, I just wanted to say that I have a, an attraction for me and I've taken the supervision and looked at it in therapy and um, see what the other person says. Yeah, that's an interesting one, that, Bob. <laughs> just thinking of somebody who's purely relational. Yeah. You know, um, but yes, of course, we can't ethically work with somebody who, you know, once we've explored all these things, um, and you need to do it straight away, not just, you know, because, you know, the danger of all this is that we, therapy, proper therapy won't happen if you're always yeah. thinking, dream, doing or listening. And, yeah. and of course, you could end up acting out something. Yes. So it's really important we refer on, um, and, you know, I think it's vitally important. We don't wait a month to see our supervisor either. Yeah. We wing them up and have an emergency session. Yeah. Or we have an emergency session with our therapist before we next see the client. Yeah. We don't, oh, well, I've got supervision in a month or I've got a therapist in two, you know, two months' time or something like that because, you know, we're sort of uh, coming from an, an ethic an unethical position yeah absolutely otherwise yeah. yeah and it's a really interesting concept and you know the the title of this you know falling in love with your clients in the therapy process and i'm sure we've discussed this in other ones but there's also the complete opposite side to this where we don't like our clients for similar reasons whether that's you know transference or whatever it is either way it's not ethical to not take that to supervision or to do something about that we we couldn't carry on seeing those clients with those strong feelings at either end of the spectrum if we, if we are i've got obsessive romantic love we have to refer on what i'm saying now is before you see the client next as soon as you're going to wear that have an emergency supervision session have an emergency therapy session just to give yourself a chance to talk about these things. Yeah. But don't see them again um, until you've resolved it. In other words, if if you can't resolve this or it, you don't understand what it's about or XXX, then you have to refer. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't do effective therapy if you don't feel, uh, you know, quite often though, by the way, I do want to give a plea, of, you know, when therapists have come to me saying the same sort of thing, they've had an emergency session, we talk about it from what I've just, the frame I've just talked about transferentially. And they seen the therapist also two days time. Sometimes they've had such a big quantum shift in understanding it's not their sexual feelings, it's actually come from somewhere else. Yeah. Or so can, it's a projective identification they have been able to work with the client. Yeah. But it is it is that taking it and talking about it with somebody who's unbiased, who can think outside of the relationship, as in the therapeutic relationship, because it is difficult when you're in that situation and that relationship with somebody to look at it objectively. Yeah, it's also difficult. Uh, again, I'm hearing this person when I said, oh, you can always go back to the client and talk about it. So you go back to the client and you say to the client, there's an option of, you know, I just want to say that I've been having sexual feelings around you, so I've taken this, this to supervision, and I was wondering if if, you, if if these feelings have come from you. or Now, it's an important dis discussion. The problem with that is, and I'm not, I'm not saying don't do it, by the way, because anything's better than continuing in a situation yeah, uh, and it's not resolved or not looked at or whatever way you want to talk about it, um, is shame. Because, you know, the, the client can get shamed very easily in all this. But at the end of the day, it has to be addressed. Yeah. And if it can't be resolved, you need to refer that person on. Yeah. Another good topic, Bob. There's a lot written on this, by the way. I did a YouTube years ago, 10 years ago, 
if you enter my web my youtube channel bob cook and put in erotic transference in I did it at least 10 years ago uh with rory lee oaks who's a friend of mine it's one of the what most watched videos i've ever done um, um i'm 10 years it's 10 years ago by the way wow long time ago so um but it, but i was talking specifically about erotic transference i do want to give a plea of though of what we started off talking about at the beginning which is what constitutes loving actions yeah in account of pondering thinking about uh your client asking your clients you know i was thinking about you last week how are you today yeah all loving actions aren't they yeah yeah that whole discussion for me is really important as is what we have just talked about because i think often this is is in the role of transference and can be resolved and there might be a quantum shift and you you can discuss it with your client but you know it's really important that if you can't resolve it you don't work with that client you need to explain it yeah yeah i'm not saying you just sort of don't turn up or something or you say well i uh, i can't work and make something up you need to be transparent and honest and in my experience clients really respect that i might come out and say well i've been sexually attracted to you and then you've got to it's discuss a really it. difficult situation to be in in that respect because i would imagine i don't know whether it's just me it could just be me but you know my fostering background and everything there was always a big thing about allegations being a foster carer do you know what i mean that, that i were i were the things that we were doing could be misconstrued by the, the kids or whatever so if if you're going to come out to a client and say you know i'm having some sexualized feelings about you does that open us up as therapists you know to have well, allegations think, against i us? think the worst position is if you continue therapy yeah and do you don't only say that i think you know in terms of transparency and referring someone on yeah because we're human aren't we absolutely yeah the problem is if in terms of allegations of things you're talking about is if you don't do that yeah but i would imagine opinion, there, there is a big fear you know with, with therapists around allegations and where that might lead well if you said to you've seen this uh, and you say look i've uh taken this to supervision and discuss that and i start to have sexual feelings with you and i feel that i can't do the therapy and i have to be transparent with you what what's your thinking about litigation there i i don't know that it's just not ethical to have those sort of feelings for a client and how it can be wow. you know misinterpreted by well, that's true no, that's true what you've just said misinterpretation yeah yeah Absolutely. well you might want to record it then yeah it was it was just a thought that you know what i mean it is a very delicate subject and the, you know the the guilt and the shame whether that's on the therapist part or the, I think the client's it's far part worse. yeah i agree jackie but i think it's far worse if you make something up and say yeah. well i just want to refer you because i don't get on with you yeah well i'm just going to refer you because i think you owe you the clients a level of transparency in all this yeah and, and it's good if you have taken it to your supervisor because then there will be a note that you've obviously spoken to your supervisor oh, yeah. about it and yeah. everything so all again that. it just i'm just thinking for anybody listening you know if they were going through this sort of a situation how they might be feeling if that makes sense well talk to your supervisor yeah take the action from there he might say well you we need to record the session yeah you say x x and x but it's very important you don't continue with somebody if uh, or or carry on in this process yeah without um tra being transparent yeah yeah i agree and in another level what you said earlier on about if you extremely hate your client or dislike them you need to talk about that in transfer in terms of the supervisory process and um see where that all comes from yeah 
because we 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 do have feelings and emotions in the therapy room that belong to us <laughs> do you know what I mean because we're co-created a relationship so we're in there all of our stuff as well as the client it's you know I think that's one of the reasons why I like the relational psychotherapy and transactional analysis because I do take the whole of myself in the room with me I don't leave parts of my personality outside the door if that makes sense so we are going to come across difficult situations with the client in the therapy room and I think using supervision using your therapist transparency and ethical integrity is the way forward yeah me too so another good podcast Bob what we're going to be talking about that could have been in the in the air of an ethical dilemma but i do think that um it's important to discuss yeah i think i think a lot of the topics that we talk about are really important and i think that's one of the reasons you know the the therapy show behind closed doors because i don't think a lot of this stuff is openly spoken about no yes, between the the therapists and the supervisors hopefully but openly with students or or you know people that are interested in therapy i don't think these things are spoken about and no and i'll give a, a sort of advert for the united kingdom council psychotherapy here which is the the, the basic i think regulating model uh not model um, authority for therapists regulating body put it that way and they demand that people trained to be therapists have 160 hours of their own therapy over four years. And they have a very strong ethical code. And it's so important. Yeah. Because if there's not this uh, accountable body, for example, um, we live in the we can we could live in the world of the Wild West. Yeah. Quite that easily. Is, yeah. Could, that any regulation or accountability. Yeah. The ACP, another important regulating body. Um, without these bodies, without these forms of accountability, without these frameworks of supervision therapy and everything that goes, goes with it, we can live in the world of the Wild West easily in a deregulated, unaccountable um, process yeah. without framework or structure. And that was set psychotherapy back to the dark ages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I first started to be trained, that's the, when I first trained, 1985, when I first went into training to be a psychotherapist, UKCP didn't, didn't exist. BACP didn't exist. There was no regulating bodies at all. Um, I was in the world of transaction analysis, which did have a European regulation, regulating body, which I really liked because it gave structure, gave ethical framework, at least gave me some sort of, you know, process could hold on to. But many of the regulating bodies in the United Kingdom didn't exist even. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was in this very young infancy of the disciplines of psychotherapy and counselling. So the regulating body at least give me some sort of protection structure and of course clients protection structure and accountability yeah definitely so bob thank you thank you thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk about the different types of love as well and in the next podcast we'll be looking at codependency in the therapy process which kind of leads on i think from this yeah, sometimes in transaction analysis world, codependence codependency is called symbiosis. Yeah. And again, in the transaction analysis world, you've got first order symbiosis, second order symbiosis. But we'll talk about it, I think, in um, the world of codependency, which is really an American word. Um, but for the people who are listening to it, you can call it symbiosis or you call it codependency. But it's a fascinating subject for what can happen often transferentially in the psychotherapy room. And the two people, therapist client, may not even be aware of it. Yeah. I think codependency is more easily understandable. Like you said, it's American, but it kind of says what it is on the tin. Mm. 
I agree with you. I look forward to discussing that. Absolutely. Until next time, Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.